Okay, so the last type of pulse modulation we're going to look at is a little bit different in that we're not embedding information into pulse characteristics in terms of their width or position or amplitude. Instead, what we're doing is we're taking bit information and encoding it into a sequence of pulses. So that's what we're gonna do with pulse coded modulation. We're gonna take samples of a signal, turn those samples into bits, and then send pulses to represent those bits. To understand everything, we need to introduce a few kind of core definitions. The first one is what we mean by a digital signal. A digital signal is a signal that is discrete in time. So when we sample, we make things discrete in time. So that's what we've been talking about in this whole set of videos lately. It's also though, has a discrete amplitude level. So by discrete amplitude level, we mean that there are just kind of a set number of allowable levels. Continuous time signals in general can take on a whole continuum of values. For instance, they can be value 1, 1.01, 1.001, right? This whole continuum of values they can take on. But if I've been discretized in time, amplitude, I'm sorry, there's only a allowable or discrete levels that I'm allowed to take on. So this is one key definition we'll need. It's what's called a digital signal. And we'll be looking at digital signals when we talk about the analog to digital conversion process, which consists of sampling in time, which we've been talking about for a while, and then quantizing. We'll get into quantizing here in just a couple charts. There's also another definition of a digital signal that's used, and one we'll actually use here as well. A digital signal can also refer to a continuous time signal. So note the difference. A digital signal can be either discrete in time and discrete in amplitude, or it's sometimes used to refer to a continuous time signal that represents bits of information. So this is actually what we're gonna be generating at the output of our pulse code modulator, a sequence of continuous time pulses, but since those pulses represent bits, it's often referred to as a digital signal. Okay, so kind of two different versions of digital signal that float around. Discrete time, discrete amplitude is one, then also any waveform, continuous time waveform that represents bits. And we'll see both of those in these videos. All right, so I mentioned quantizing. Quantizing is the other piece that we need or definition to talk about pulse code modulation. Quantizing is the process of rounding a sample value to a set of discrete amplitudes. So when we sample in time, we grab the value of the continuous time waveform. And then when we quantize, we take that value and we round it to some allowable discrete amplitude level. So for instance, if I was to sample the signal and get maybe the number 1.04279395, right, that just goes on for forever, technically, I can't write down a number that goes on for forever on my computer. I have to round it to some fixed number of bits or fixed number of precision. The process of rounding that original sample to its final discrete amplitude level is what's called quantizing. The entire process of sampling in time and then quantizing is what A to D converters, analog to digital converters do. They take continuous time signals, they sample in time, so they discretize in time. They take those sample values and they round them, the process of quantizing. So when we're done, we have a list of numbers and each one of those numbers is actually from a set of discrete amplitudes. And then our final definition that we'll need, what do we mean by an l airy signal? So a digital signal that takes on L different values is called l airy. So for instance, when I'm doing the analog to digital conversion process, I'm sampling in time, I'm taking my sample values and I'm rounding them to their discrete levels. The number of levels is what I would indicate by L. So maybe I have four levels or eight levels or 16 levels that I'm allowed to round to. Then I would call that a four airy or an eight airy or a 16 airy signal. So signals that have only kind of L possible values are what are called L airy signals. Towards the end of this uh, set of videos, we'll look at digital signals and why we like them in terms of only being able to take on kind of a fixed number of possible values. They have a lot of, a lot of advantages. They're very resilient to noise. We can use repeaters to easily decode and then regenerate those messages. We can do really advanced error control coding. 
and cryptography to encode the messages. So there's lots of advantages to working with digital signals that come from a finite number of possible things. Continuous time signals, those can be anything, right? They can take on this whole continuum of values, and in reality, every continuous time signal can be very different. Digital signals, though, come from kind of this finite alphabet of L things. So we restrict ourselves to a finite list of things, and because of that, we have a lot of advantages that we'll see later on. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at some examples of this full analog to digital conversion process. In this plot here on the left, I have a blue curve, which represents my original continuous time signal, x of t. And then what I've done is I have sampled in time that ind are indicated by each of these stems. I have sampled in time at each of these locations discreetly in time. So we've discretized in time. And then I have rounded those sample values to an allowable discrete level. For instance, at this point here in time, when I sampled, I actually grabbed this value of the continuous time signal x of t. But that value, what, about 2.75-ish or so, wasn't one of my allowed levels. So I had to round that value to one of the allowed levels. In this particular example, my allowed levels are 0, 1, 2, 3, minus 1, minus 2, and it looks like minus 2.5. So given this value right here, the closest number was three, so I rounded it to three. Similarly, right here, when I sampled in time, I got a number about 1.4. Well, that's not one of my allowable levels, so I had to round it to this nearest level right here, the value one. And we've repeated that process everywhere. So we have sampled in time and then quantized to the nearest allowable level. You can see some of the parameters up here. L in this case was six. There were one, two, three, four, five, six allowable levels. The peak value was three. So I assume that my signal lies between three and three. And then delta V, the step size between levels was equal to one. Obviously through the act of rounding my sample values to these discrete levels, I've actually introduced error, right? This number right here that I actually wrote down as my discrete level, does not match the actual value of the signal at that time. So that introduced what we call quantization error, which I have plotted over here. Every time we round, we're actually introducing error into what we've written down. However, if I use more levels, as I've done here, now I have 12 levels. Now the amount of rounding that I perform isn't as severe. So my quantization error is actually a little bit smaller on average. If I use even more levels, in this case, I've used 48 levels now. You almost can't tell the difference between the discrete levels and the original sample values because there are so many levels packed in here on this amplitude axis that when I round, the amount of rounding is very, very small. So in general, we like very, lots of levels to reduce the number of quantization error. However, as we increase the number of levels, the number of bits required to store that information increases. So there's always this fundamental trade-off between liking more levels in terms of reducing quantization error, but it comes at the cost of the more levels I have, the more bits of information I have to use to represent those levels. And we'll see that here in the next chart. So here is how we actually finally get to pulse-coded modulation. This analog to digital process gives us a list of numbers, and those numbers come from a fixed set of discrete amplitudes, what we call the levels. For instance, if I was using eight levels, I would have level zero, level one, level two, right? There would be eight total levels spread out across the amplitude axis. Each one of those levels I can think about as representing some binary number. So level zero, I could use to represent zero, zero, zero. Level one would represent 0, 0, 001. So what we do when we want to use pulse code modulation, after I have sampled in time and quantized, I think of that sample value at the discrete level as representing bits. So if I wanted to transmit bits 0, 1, 1, for instance, I would actually transmit the sequence of pulses, a negative, a positive, a positive. So here, is finally where we're getting to sending pulses to represent information. When I send you a negative pulse followed by a positive pulse followed by a positive pulse, you look at that and you see, ah, that represents binary information zero, 
one, one, which I can then map back to a level, level three. And then ahead of time, we've agreed what level three is. Maybe level three represents voltage 0.25. And then you can go right down 0.25 as the sample value, the quantized sample value, mind you, of the original signal. Similarly, let's take, say I sampled in time and rounded to level 6. Well, level 6 is represented by binary 110. So to represent or to transmit information that means the level 6 amplitude, maybe level 6 amplitude is 1.4 volts, I would need to transmit a sequence of pulses represented by 110. So we would transmit a positive pulse, a positive pulse, and then a negative pulse. So this is what we mean by pulse-coded modulation. The pulses actually tell us the binary values, and those binary values map to a level number, and a level number maps to a voltage or a sample value, a quantized sample value. Okay, to conclude our discussion of PCM, let's just do a little bit of math related to quantization error. As we've seen and discussed, when we quantize, we are actually introducing error. The discrete level that we write down does not perfectly match, in general, the value of the sample at that time. In general, as we use more levels, the quantization error goes down because I'm not rounding as much. But as I use more and more levels, say 8, 16, 32, Eight levels required three bits or three pulses of information to represent. 16 levels rep requires four bits of information to represent, so I'd have to send four pulses or store off four bits for every level. 32 levels of information requires five bits of information. So it's definitely gonna come at the cost of storing or sending more bits. As a specific example, compact disks, for instance, they sample at a rate of 44.1 kilohertz, and each one of these samples, so that's 44,100 samples per second, each one of those samples is represented using 16 bits. So that means they are using 2 to the 16 or 65536 levels. So that's a lot of levels, and that means we're not going to have a lot of quantization error, which obviously we don't have, because so when you listen to CDs, things sound really good. Another thing that they do is they actually use error control coding to code this information before stored to disk. They actually use something called Reed Solomon coding, which are good for what are called burst errors. Often when we scratch disk, we eliminate bits and big chunks. Well, Reed Solomon codes are good at recovering errors that wipe out errors in kind of a chunk or a burst of data. We've talked about quantization levels being separated by the amount delta V. MP was the amount of kind of positive and negative amplitude I had for my signal. I set MP such that plus MP to minus MP completely engulfs my signal. So if between minus MP and MP, that's a swath of 2 MP on the amplitude axis. If that entire amplitude axis is broken into L parts, 2 MP over L tells me that the quantization levels are spaced by delta V. So delta V was used in our plots a little while ago to represent the spacing between levels. Since this is the spacing between my levels, when I make a rounding decision, at worst, I'll be right between two levels. So at worst, I'm gonna have an error that is half this. So at most, I'll have a quantization error of plus delta V over two, and at most negative, I would have a quantization error of minus delta V over two. So my quantization errors are always gonna be uniformly distributed over this plus minus delta V over two. Since quantization actually introduces error, we can talk about the signal to quantization noise. Really this quantization you can think of as introducing noise to your signal. So there was originally some signal content that had some kind of like energy or power. As we've rounded, we've introduced this noise power. We can quantify that ratio. And if you work through the math, it turns out that the signal to quantization noise ratio looks like this. It's a function of the number of levels, L. It's a function of the original power in the original signal. So if I have a very strong signal, quantization noise doesn't impact it as much. And it's also a function of MP, kind of the swath that I set up on the amplitude axis. Obviously, large signal to noise ratio is good. We like a lot of signal power and very small amounts of quantization noise. And this equation right here captures the parameters that are relevant. For instance, as L gets larger, which is a good thing, 
in terms of rounding error going down, my signal to noise ratio increases. Similarly, as my noise power or my uh, signal power gets larger, that's a good thing. So my signal to noise ratio increases. All right, a few more comments. Usually we round levels to L to some power of two. So in some of the early examples, I think I used like six levels or 12 levels or 48 things like that. You can do that, but almost always in practice, we're gonna round it to a power of two because that makes the bit encoding so much easier. Eight levels is represented by three bits. 16 levels is represented by four bits. And there's this really nice mapping between levels and bit representation. So we almost always do that. Another thing we also usually do is this number here can be very large. Think about CDs. CDs have an L equal to 65536, and then I square that, so this becomes a very large number. So almost always when we talk about signal to quantization noise ratio, we almost always express it in dB. So we take the 10 log 10 of this quantity. So to have a signal to quantization noise ratio of 60 dB or 70 dB is not uncommon. And it's much easier to write it as 70 dB as opposed to, you know, like 100 million very large linear numbers.